How's that? All right. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for coming to Solar Washington meeting tonight. Um, uh, we've got a few um, uh, presentations that we'll do tonight. Uh, first, we'll have um, uh, Kilowatts for Humanity to speak. Uh, then uh, we're going to do a um, kind of review of the Solar Summit. Can you guys all hear me? Is this get, getting better? There we are. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do is review the Solar Summit that we just had. Um, there was a reason why we missed last month's meeting is we were trying to scramble and get together a, a solar summit put together and I think how many people do we have on that? Uh, shy of 200 industry people attended so uh, it was very well received in that. Um, we've got some work to do but um, I think we got a lot of key, uh, key issues brought out to the table to be discussed. Uh, so we're going to spend the last half of the meeting discussing that. Um, I want to thank our uh, uh, sponsors that have joined us. Um, we basically are a volunteer organization. Um, we have our day our day jobs, and then we are uh, put a lot of time into uh, keeping guys informed with solar in, in the state of Washington. So thanks to all our sponsors. Um, I do need to get glasses; a regular thing. I just yeah. And normally I'm filling in for Patrick, uh, who's out tonight, and. Um, David Nickel, our president, he's actually up in Alaska doing some work, so uh, we're doing a quick imprompt uh, fill-in meeting here. Um, uh, we want to thank everyone that did attend the Solar Summit this year. Um, that was, as I said earlier, it was a very productive event, and appreciate it. we appreciate anybody who came. And then afterwards, we're going to uh, head down to the Finney Market. That's our kind of after meeting. Uh, refreshment time and time to just network and visit with each other and discuss um, any topics solar energy related. So, um, all right. So the first presentation will be done by Kilowatts of Humanity. Um, they are a locally based nonprofit which has been implementing international and rural electrification projects, including solar, since 2009. Um, Kilowatts for Humanity engages with communities, local NGOs. Uh, NGO partners to provide appropriate electrical services where it's needed the most. Uh, Kilowatt for Humanity volunteers come from a variety of backgrounds unified by the common desire to end energy poverty around the world. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, so tonight we've got Kim Shields and Henry Louie uh, who will present for Kilowatts for Humanity. All right. Thank you. Thanks for having us here. It's pretty exciting to be invited to a group such as yourself. We we are practitioners. We use solar energy. So the, oh, okay. Because we're doing a webinar tonight. Oh, you are. Okay. Unclamp it. Awesome. And a short cord. Okay. So I'll just stay over here. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm Henry Louis. I am one of the founders of Kilowatts for Humanity. My day job is I am a professor at Seattle University. I teach electrical engineering over there. Um, Kim, why don't you introduce yourself now? We're going to sort of tag team the presentation. 
I'm Kim Shields. Um, I am the secretary for Kilowatts for Humanity, and I'm also an engineer at Boeing. So like, um, like your organization, we are a volunteer-driven organization ourselves. Um, the motivation for what we do is that around the world, about a billion people, in fact, over a billion people, don't have access to electricity. Something that we take for granted is having electricity available. It's incredibly cheap, and it's reliable. I mean, even that big, that big windstorm we were supposed to have a couple weeks ago, you know, there were some power outages, but it wasn't very prolonged. So a billion people every day, they don't have access to electricity. Every night, they go to bed without the benefit of light. Their children can't study. It's unsafe. And they really lack a lot of the modern conveniences and dignity that goes along with having access to electricity. In villages such like as this, when you want to get water, uh, there's usually a, a well, and you have to lower a bucket down and fill it up and, and pull on the rope to bring it back up. And then usually it's women that do this. I think, Kim, actually, you did that at one of the, the villages we worked in. And you have to put the bucket on your head. And that bucket that you see up there that that little girl has on her head is like an inch from the top. I mean, it is full of water. And I asked her if I could try putting it on my head, and she said, there's no way. And, uh, I was actually glad that, that she said I couldn't do it. So this is the day-to-day the -day life for for uh, a lot of people in, in rural sub-Saharan Africa. Now, when you don't have access to electricity, um, at night what you use for light is generally kerosene or, or candles. So a kerosene lamp is, is shown there. Um, I actually, if you're interested after my talk, um, I brought one with me that I got in Zambia. But it's really just a re repurposed aerosol can that's sort of been soldered. And you can see from that picture, uh, the flame is, is blowing in the wind. What happens is these kerosene lamps can tip over, uh, ign igniting and uh, burning down houses. The, the number of burns and scalds that are related to, to kerosene in the developing world is, uh, I think it's somewhere around 400,000 uh, in some parts of sub-Saharan Africa each year alone, for just the set part. In addition, the particulates that you inhale from being around that low quality kerosene light uh, it, it can cause respiratory illness and and disease. Uh, if you don't have electricity, you're going to be cooking with solid fuels uh, like wood or charcoal, and about almost three billion people in the world don't have access to modern fuels f for cooking. Kilowatts for Humanity, uh, what we do is we focus on the electricity side of this energy poverty question. So we look at providing access to electricity to those in rural areas that don't have an electricity grid and probably won't for decades at the earliest. Not only do we provide electricity, but we see that electricity access as a way of uh, creating sustainable businesses. So we don't just drop in solar panels and, and batteries and walk away. Uh, we understand that these solar panels need to be replaced. We understand that maintenance needs to be done on the batteries. And so we build a business plan around all of these solar installations we do so that income can be generated and used to pay for repairs and replacements. We also see electricity as an opportunity for growing an economic engine in that area. So not only providing electricity for lighting, but also for things like refrigeration and, and um, uh, television access. We're a volunteer organization, and our volunteers we work on designing systems, raising money to install the systems, and also providing mentorship to the organizations in country that we partner with. So we partner with local NGOs uh, that want to start up these electricity-based businesses. So that's, that's what we do. We come from a variety of backgrounds. We're located, I mean, we're based in Seattle. We have meetings uh, every, every two weeks at Seattle University. We're thinking of moving that around. We have about 30 or so dedicated volunteers from different backgrounds. So not just engineers, business people, we have accountants, people from um, the social sciences, because starting up a business takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of, of uh, effort aside from the technical part. So we have people from, from all over that, that uh, come and, and work with us. When we go and, and, and provide access to electricity, we work with local NGOs um, we work with vendors. We don't go and install the solar panels ourselves. We, even in countries like uh, Zambia or Kenya, there, there are 
organizations and, and companies there that uh, do the installation. And so you're helping build capacity. We're not reverse outsourcing the job, having our volunteers uh, compete with our free labor for against a company over there that's trying to do this for a living. So we, we work with local companies, local NGOs to provide access to electricity. Uh, if you want to know sort of the, the scope and scale, here are our two most recent projects that we've done. Um, we, we adopt what's called the energy kiosk model where we have little uh, buildings that we install solar panels on and inside, you know, that's where we have the inverter, the battery, the charge controllers. And in those spaces, we provide um, a ser retail services. People can get their phone charged there, for example. They can buy cold drinks or even just, just um, basic groceries. Uh, again, there's a big sustainable business part of what we do. These things require maintenance, they require care, and there's a business opportunity there. Uh, so you can see in the back in one of these pictures uh, the, all the groceries that are available. This is in a, 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 a village called Philly Baba, and there's not a grocery store for many, many miles, and so now they have one in their community. When we uh, provide a community with access to electricity, it's amazing to see what uses they put it to. So cell phone charging is a big one. Uh, most people in rural areas, believe it or not, have cell phones, even though the grid isn't there. And they'll walk 10 kilometers each way to get that cell phone charged. Tremendous amount of time, tremendous amount of effort. And now they can do it locally. Right? It's amazing. It's a big time saver. Um, we have battery kits and solar home systems that people can rent and uh, the children can study at night. In some of our locations, which are by, by uh, lakes and rivers, selling ice and preserving fish is really popular. So that fishermen, when they catch their fish, they can preserve it and they can take it to more distant markets, get a higher price. Uh, this is one of my favorite ones. <laughs> this is a, a sheet that has been hung and the kiosk is right here and they actually have like movie nights every so often. So to go to this community before they had any electricity uh, and then to go and see them having movie nights was, was pretty incredible to see. They charge a small fee. Um, and, and, and so you get sort of an idea of the enterprise that can be associated with electricity and that's how we, we that's the model that we follow for the income generation. Uh, one other thing that we do that I think is quite unique about Kilowatts for Humanity is that in all of our systems we install this data acquisition remote monitoring system. So anywhere in the world, I, can, I mean my office in Seattle, I can pull up a website and see exactly how much energy our systems are producing. We can make sure that they're behaving as we design them. And if something goes wrong, we can help troubleshoot remotely. So we use this data not just for, you know, operational decision making, but we also do research on it. You know, being embedded at a university, we, we like to uh, encourage our students to participate in our group. They can do research projects with the data. We do, we do research projects with the data. So we're really trying to make off-grid electrification smarter and more efficient. So we do electrification. We do sustainable business, and we do remote monitoring, and those, I think, are our strengths. I'm going to turn it over to Kim now, and she's going to talk about some of our, our projects in, in more detail. So as Henry mentioned, I'm just going to go over some of the details of our projects. You can see here we've been mainly focused in uh, southern Africa. Uhuru Bay was our first project in Kenya on the shores of Lake Victoria. After that, we moved to Philly Baba in northern Zambia. Chiloqua in southern Zambia, and we have a future project planned in Munyama nearby. Um, we also are working in the Philippines. We've done an assessment there and have partnered with some strong organizations on the ground and hoping to do a kiosk there as well. So our first project in Muhuru Bay, Kenya was installed in 2014. It was sponsored by the Alston Foundation for the Environment. We also used uh, Seattle electrical engineering students to do the design. And it was a wind and solar powered kiosk, about five kilowatt capacity. Um, you can see the kiosk there, it was stationed at a local primary school. Um, so it also provided electricity for the home of the school's headmaster, and he became the owner and operator of the kiosk. And there was a variety of services offered, but it was mainly rolled out with a focus on providing portable battery kits that members of the community could rent with the idea that they would bring them back to the kiosk to be charged, and then when they took them home, 
they could use them for light and cell phone charging. So a bit more about the business operations. Um, after 18 months of operation, they've brought in over $5,000 of revenue. The initial success, however, of those portable battery kits dwindled over time. Um, as time went on, people were not as willing to pay for the electricity at home, and uh, they, be they became more unpopular. However, the kiosk owners and the community themselves identified an opportunity to make and sell ice for the local fishermen. Um, so they bought this chest freezer and use it to make bags of ice that they sell, as well as to make cold drinks. So chart there of the revenue sources. Cold sodas are obviously bringing in a lot of revenue. However, there's cost associated with operating that line of business. Um, and the ice there, when this chart was made, was only that business was only in operation for five months. But it's shown to be extremely popular. The demand often uh, exceeds the supply. There's also a picture here of just some notebook pages and shows the simplified record keeping model that we have um, so that they can maintain daily logs of the income and the expenses that go along with the kiosk. And typically they'll take photos of those and text them to us and we can help guide the business operations and make sure that they're doing well. So some maintenance uh, and upgrades over time. We've had several follow-up trips on the order of every six months or so to check out this kiosk. Um, we go and inspect major components, ensure the batteries aren't dehydrated, and retrain the operators if we need to on all the switches and emergency operations. Um, we tend to do this early on in projects and then hope that the operators can take them over and they don't need our assistance um, after they've gained more experience. With, uh, at 18 months, we also installed a new data logger shown on the right with improved transmission and new meters, which allowed us to measure the energy consumption from the kiosk and the headmaster's home separately. So overall, some challenges that we experienced with this first project of ours. Um, despite having interviewed community members and hiring one of them to be the manager of the kiosk, he ended up stealing funds and disappearing, uh, which is quite unfortunate. but not all that surprising. So um, we always try to vet candidates well and hire someone from the local community and really tell them that this is a benefit to their community, right? And they're helping themselves and helping each other by running this business orally and ethically. Um, we also saw some falsified income records early on. We thought that they were trying to sort of forge some income statements for the kiosk to try to show us what they thought we wanted to see. So again, it highlighted a need for better training, that providing accurate records really gives us insight on if they're saving and able to replace their components over time. So it's really for their own benefit to keep good records. Uh, there's also some commingling of the funds with the primary school, being that the headmaster is the owner. Um, he tends to take revenue from the kiosk to pay his teachers, which is beneficial, but it makes it hard for us to track uh, the profitability of the kiosk. There's also a lack of correlation between the surveys that we did initially with the community and then what ended up happening when we rolled out the battery kits. So from our surveys, they indicated the high willingness to pay for electricity and a willingness to pay a lot of money for it. And then when we rolled out these kits, we saw they really couldn't afford it over time. So we needed to find a new way to identify how much they'd really be willing to pay for this new technology that they've never had access to before. Um, but a lot of successes. It's generated over five megawatt hours of energy. Um, there's been no major system downtime. When there was an issue with one of the wind turbines, because we used in-country vendors, they were able to come out and fix it efficiently. Um, as we said, the community itself identified new revenue sources. And this is really important, something we rely on they know better what they need, right? We aren't going to come from Seattle and tell them what they should sell. So that was a great, great improvement. Um, and it also stimulated the economy and new businesses popped up around the kiosks since there's a lot of foot traffic there. Now there's women selling homemade bread and other things trying to make money. So it's great to see. So we took a lot of these lessons learned and applied them to our next project, uh, which is in Philly Baba, Zambia. It was sponsored by IEEE Smart Village. Um, this time we actually partnered with a local NGO, Leachy's Community Solutions. So rather than the headmaster of the school, we now have an NGO in country, um, more established organization that's going to operate the kiosk. Um, 
you saw this picture down here of just a solar kiosk this time, no wind component. And this is our kiosk uh, owner, Lakange, who we met through IEEE Connections. Um, so a new feature of this kiosk was that it was actually wired to two local homes and a church for direct wired electricity access. Some other business improvements that we made, we improved our community surveys and analysis methods. So as I mentioned, instead of asking what are you willing to pay for electricity, we looked at what are you already paying for similar things, batteries, candles, cell phone charging in the nearest city, things like that, so that we could provide replacement services at the same cost. Um, we also shifted from these portable battery kits to rent to own solar home systems. So there are also batteries that can charge cell phones, provide light, um, but they come with their own solar panel that can be placed on the outside of each individual's home. And they're on a rent-to-own basis. We found that having ownership of the device was much more popular than just renting over time. Um, and we also improved our record-keeping methods. You can see Henry down there training the kiosk manager. So I mentioned the expanded services, um, those rent-to-home solar home systems have lights. Um, up on the right there is one of the rechargeable radios that they come with, and some also have TVs um, down in the bottom center. So this allows for people that do have more income can pay to upgrade their services and have more and more accessories with their battery kits. Um, there's also the grocery store that Henry mentioned, and on the right, bottom right is the church. Our volunteers also donated a keyboard for that church, so they're able to have music for their service for the first time. Some technical improvements. We've obviously iterated on and improved our technical design. Um, with the data that we got from Kenya, we were able to have better load profiling for our kiosk and an enhanced data logger as well with additional sensors. So our challenges right now with Philly Baba, there's a very high demand for those rent-to-own solar home systems. Um, but they do come at a cost, and so the kiosk needs to build up enough profits and so that they can purchase more. Um, there's also low profit margins on some of their other services, like the groceries, and they also sell a cell phone talk time. Um, but they're not as profitable as we'd like, so they still need to come up with some new revenue sources to maintain their kiosk over time. Um, but over, uh, this was installed about a year ago, so in the last year there's been 500 kilowatt hours of energy, no downtime, over 1,500 cell phones have been charged at the kiosk. So as Henry mentioned, the long distances they were traveling to get their phones charged, that's a lot of time saved. Um, they've already seen over $1,000, $4,000 in revenue, and it was a host for an IEEE Smart Village operator workshop that you can see in the photo there. So our next project was installed this past June in Chiloqua, Zambia, down in the south. Um, it was sponsored by GE Renewable Energy and their initiative called We Share the Power. Um, we improved by partnering with our, our most mature NGO to date, which is Green Trust. And uh, that's two local Zambians who have operated businesses before and are very experienced. They've been great. Um, so there's a lot of new services with the, this kiosk, and you can see just from the pictures, another improvement would it, is that it was housed in a repurposed shipping container um, that GE was able to get for us. Um, so a lot of the similar services with cell phone and battery charging, solar home systems. We also provided a laptop for the local school that can be charged at the kiosk, and they're looking as well at the ice and uh, frozen meat sales have been very popular. Like I just mentioned, here's a, an initial chart. They've only been in operation for a couple months. You can see the cold drinks and chicken and processed pork are their most popular items. Um, so they're using their freezer space for a lot of meat. Um, and they, uh, they do have a stronger focus on refrigeration with plans to expand their capacity there. So we've sized the system for that. They, they are purchasing another freezer and expanding that line of service. And this is our kiosk manager. Her name is Beauty, and she's there showing one of the products that's uh, for sale at the kiosk, which is just a small solar-powered light. Um, and they grow from there for more capacity. So a future project that's in the works is in a similar area in Zambia, a community called Munyama. It's a fishing community, and we anticipate a large 5-kilowatt solar system. 
The primary focus here, again, is going to be ice and refrigeration because uh, it's near a river. And uh, we'll be doing the design this fall and into the spring for an installation trip possibly next summer. We also, as I mentioned, are looking at a project in the Philippines. We sent an assessment team there this April to look at a community that they identified was not a great fit for a project for us. Um, but they met with local vendors on the ground and also built a new relationship with some foundations in the area that we've been working with since to write new proposals and get project going there. Um, so that's, that's going to expand our reach outside of Africa. It's exciting. We also uh, advise on other projects with organizations like Engineers Without Borders um, and other groups that are doing solar energy type projects. So we really appreciate you guys having us here tonight. Um, if any of this sparked your interest and you want to know how you can help, um, please volunteer with us. We look for people of all backgrounds, educators, engineers, business people, finance. We'll take anything. Um, you can also donate. We have a donate button on our website, which is there, kilowattsforhumanity.org. Uh, since we're all volunteer like you guys, we have low overhead cost, and a lot of, more of your money goes directly to the projects. And last, if you just want to share our story, we're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Tell your friends, tell your colleagues, um, just help us get the word out there. So really appreciate it. Thank you. OK, we got time for a few questions here. Maybe you could maybe you could introduce yourselves again for all the folks who just um, who came in since you started. But my question is, how much are those solar home kits in U.S. dollars? What would be the equivalent? Okay, thanks. I'm I'm Henry Louis. I am the current president and one of the co-founders of Kilowatts for Humanity. My day job, I'm a professor at Seattle University. I teach electrical and computer engineering there. And I'll let Kim introduce herself before I answer your question. And I'm Kim Shields. I'm the secretary for Kilowatts for Humanity and an aero engineer at Boeing. Do you want to talk about the cost? Sure, yeah. So um, depending on the capacity, uh, the kits that power ba uh, TVs are more expensive than the ones that just power radios and so on. But um, they're on the order of a couple hundred dollars, US dollars. So the advantage that our service provides is um, payment plans. So they can be paid off over long periods of time whereas um, normally you just have to buy it off the shelf and instead we offer through the kiosk, they can pay the kiosk and payment plans, small monthly payments until they've paid it off. So. so I guess I'll ask a question part of that. So that must be a small battery that they bring to there to the site, plug it in, allow it to charge and then take it back home hours or days later? We've done different models. Um, what we're seeing nowadays is that these the solar home system products, which are generally lithium ion batteries nowadays with solar panels, they can stay at the home. And so the risk that you have is that somebody, you know, won't show up to pay you. Now that's the risk that you run. Uh, I'm happy to report that that hasn't been a, a, a issue in, in our two sites. I mean, you can try to protect yourself against that in several ways. Most of the time in these villages, they're very closely knit. And um, one of our sites, for example, the kiosk, uh, the, the NGO that runs the kiosk, you know, requires a recommendation from one of the, the headmen or one of the chiefs to do it. Um, but in general, people, if we do a good, if we do our job, the community understands that money needs to flow into this kiosk for it to, to stay. And uh, that, that's sort of well understood. But it certainly is a risk. Um, there now there's also pay as you go options now where people uh, you can remotely shut off the solar home system if they don't make a payment so the technology is, is moving in that way it's really been fascinating to see how much this product alone or the suite of products has evolved in the last couple of years that's kind of what I uh, wanted to ask so you that uh, these this um, rent to uh, rent to own they are connected to your grid. Or how do you? Because you said you you have data, so they are not just separate from any other. Uh, so, so the solar home systems that we offer, those are not connected to the grid. They don't need. They have their own solar panels, or their own internal batteries. So, the data that we collect is associated with the kiosk itself, the panels on the kiosk. Which, you know, if you have refrigerators, it's a significant load to have to serve with those uh, solar panels. So we, we 
it lets us answer questions like, you know, selling this frozen meat and ice is really popular. Can we add another freezer? You know, we, we get asked that. And so we can actually look at the data and see how much they're using now and say yes. Or if it's been a bunch of cloudy days, we could say, you know, you, you might, if you can, turn off one of the freezers if you, if you can do that. Or take some other actions because you don't have enough sunlight coming in right now and you need to let the batteries recharge. So we use data for all sorts of things. More questions? I came in late, so you might have already addressed it, but could you just talk a little more about how you selected the sites? Oh, okay. Yeah, um, so, you know, there's countless villages that, that lack access to electricity, a billion people. Um, so there's many opportunities to do this. When we select a site, um, some of the factors, I mean, the, the primary factor is, do we think it can be sustainable? Can we put it in there? Do we think it can be sustainable? So what that means is we have to get an idea, get a sense of the community, get a sense of the community's ability to afford electricity. And tragically, there are communities that can't. And as much as we'd want to provide access to electricity, in a few years something will fail and there won't be any, any way for it to continue. So we have to select based upon need, uh, based upon our local NGO partner. So we, did, you know, we, like, we don't own any of these kiosks. Our, our, our NGO partner, typically a nonprofit, owns it. And so where are they comfortable? Where do they have that presence? And then uh, I think another major constraint is, comes from the donor side. So sometimes our donors are very specific about where or what region they want this kiosk to be in. So, you know, I guess maybe if there's an upside to a billion people not having access to electricity is that usually in the region that they identified, there's a village there that needs it. So those are the cons types of constraints that we operate with, yeah, in selecting a, a village. And we do, I should also say, we do a lot of surveying during our assessment trips and we will decide, you know, is this a good location? Do we think it's going to be sustainable there? Yeah. Not, uh, we haven't had, I mean, so when we go there, we, we meet with the district commissioner, like the local politician, the chief, and often, I mean, usually the NGO has those relationships and they know who should we, we should talk to, but no, we, we don't uh, let the president of Zambia decide, you know, where this kiosk goes. Um, yeah, it would be against our principles to, to do that sort of thing. Um, so politics hasn't been a big issue, but in, in other groups that do similar things, you know, I've heard stories that the chief will only approve it if it's located near their house and they can get electricity for free, you know. So things like that happen, but we haven't run into anything like that. Just as a follow-up to that, do the Jesuits have anything to do with it? As the Jesuit University, Seattle University, and Jesuits you know, go, going all over the world um, evangelizing and helping people. Does any of that ethic or um, the NGO's affiliation have, you know, inform each other? Right. Uh, gr great question. Yeah, Seattle University is a, is a Jesuit university. And um, early on, we relied on the Jesuit network to get our feet wet in energy development. So small projects, pilot projects, we relied on, on Jesuits in country. Uh, nowadays, our biggest Jesuit connection is through the university. So most of our meetings are held at Seattle University. Um, I'm a faculty member there. All three of the founders of Kilowatts for Humanity had some relationship with Seattle University. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, of interaction with the university at that level. Also, students participate in our projects at, at various levels, working with our, our practitioner volunteers that we have. So, I mean, the Jesuits would say that, you know, love is a virtue that is uh, best expressed in, in deeds, not words. And so this is, I think, one way that we are able to, you know, express love for humanity, which is very much a Jesuit within the Jesuit tradition. Yeah. Another question? Does Seattle University have a renewable energy program? Uh, not, so not that many universities have a program directed towards renewable energy. We offer classes that are related. So next quarter, if you want to enroll, I'm teaching a class on renewable energy. This quarter, I'm teaching a class on off-grid electrical systems. So very much tied, in, tied into this. So our students get it in the classroom. And, and you know, off, there many students have come with us to 
watch the implementation and to participate in the training aspects or installing the data logger. So, you know, it's really good for the students uh, to, to be able to work with professionals uh, on these types of things. It's great. <clears throat> I'm sure there's a lot of variety, but I'm curious about what the cost is for these kiosks, uh, and maybe in particular the one that had the container that looked like maybe the more recent one. Um, I'm just curious what the what the budget is that you need for something like that. Yeah, that's a great question. So depending on the, and I'm hoping you're asking that because you're about to write us a check. <laughs> um, so uh, the equipment for a, a kiosk, a typical kiosk, might be somewhere between $10,000 and $15,000, somewhere in that range. We use, again, in-country suppliers whenever possible, which is usually possible. When you start adding on costs for um, our assessment trips, our due diligence trips, that sort of thing, it obviously increases. It's pretty expensive to have a plane ticket. Uh, when our students travel, they usually get support from the university or through other resources. I'm going to put uh, Matt Shields, Dr. Matt Shields, on this. Um, <laughs> I'm going to ask Matt about the container question because I don't remember how much that one cost. Um, yeah, so I was the trip leader on this most recent project. Um, so basically it cost us, uh, yeah, it was about 10000 for the solar equipment in the order of about 5000 for the products that we sold at the kiosk. Mm -hmm. And then for the kiosk container itself, the container was donated, but we had to uh, reconstruct it into the... Um, the more attractive and user-friendly model it was now, and that cost us about three thousand. Yeah. Um, so, so all up, um, including travel, follow-up trips, um, and all of all of the equipment, the the cost was in the order of thirty k. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, that's that's tip, fairly typical. We've in the past have worked. Obviously, I, well, there's not a picture of it right here, but with kiosks that weren't in shipping containers, right? That was just you know one of the one of the modifications for this site, something that um, made a lot of sense for this particular kiosk. I guess quick question on e equipment. Are you you're able to find most of it uh, on the continent? Uh, wind turbines I know are made over there. Um, yeah, the wind turbines were made locally actually, right. or in Kenya. Um, the solar panels, batteries, you know, yeah, you can get them. I mean, they're obviously imported. Um, there's not local manufacturing of that. They're imported and, you know, I think it makes a lot of sense to, to have a local source, a local distributor. You know, warranties, uh, repair work, all of that is, is much easier. So sometimes, you know, other groups might get a donation, they'll go and solicit for donations of panels. Then you have to get them in country. And then what happens if they fail? Or inverters, you know, so you actually can spend more money and more time on those issues than it would be worth, you know. <laughs> so it's like, thanks for the donation, but it, you know, it's a, it's a lot more difficult. There's a lot of advantages to using in-country suppliers, and only only like our data logging system is. I mean, that's what we what we import ourselves. That's about the only piece. So so the inverter and the charge controllers are in-country. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Support local manufacturers. What about the data logger and monitoring? Do you bring it from here? Yeah. In fact, our our we have a, a team in our volunteer group that uh, works on the data logger and we constantly upgrade it and you know it's a fun kind of engineering project with a real world application it's, it's important you know it plays an important role so yeah we bring those with us and there's actually other other groups uh, that see our data and they want access to the data that we have because it's on all, all on a public website um, they also want our data loggers so it's something that there's a, um, a need for in this off-grid space absolutely there's a link to it from that website. Uh, the data is actually on kw4, number 4, h.org. Yeah. And you can access it from here. And if you uh, at, come up to any of us after the, the talk, we can write that down for you and give us give you our cards and that sort of thing. So if you want to see what's going on in Zambia right now, we could show you. Yeah. I guess I got one other question. Um, how is system sizing work, how working out? Um, are you finding challenges with um, just annual climate challenges relative to load, or do you find you do a load analysis and then all of a sudden your, your <laughs> customers tell you or don't tell you that they add things? And uh, so this is a great question. It's actually an area that that uh, we do research in. Is you know how do you know how much an energy kiosk in Zambia 
how much energy are they going to use, especially when we have wired customers, right? It's really not well known. Um, I like to make the analogy. It's like if I were to ask you, hey, I'm going to give you this private jet, but you just have to estimate really accurately how much fuel you're going to use. Right? You'd have not much of an idea. You would just make up some number. So <laughs> unfortunately, that, that's the, more or less the state of the art is trying to, to infer and try to guess what people are going to use on, uh, on the electrical side. Now that we have this data logger system, it, we have this feedback loop. So we know, OK, this particular location, they have a freezer. They have this many security lights. This is the typical load. These are what the houses use so that the next one is based upon that rather than just guesses, right? So it's a challenge. Um, I wish there was a perfect solution. But uh, for the most part, our systems have been oversized, we found out, and that the good part about that is it allows our NGO to grow into it. The bad part about that is, you know, you spend a bit more money up front to make it happen. Yeah. Okay. I guess to continue on that, you, let's say you have a, a very good production period, say during the summer months or whatever, do you uh, offer discounted rates on power to encourage consumption? Uh, we haven't done anything that fancy. It's possible our NGOs are doing something like that, but no, I mean, it's, it's, um, yeah, we're, we're not at that level to try to, to do that yet. Okay, so you haven't brought the blenders over and iced. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah no, we're, we're, we haven't done that. More questions? Do you want to talk about that? Yes, sure. The question answers, was yes. <laughs> whether or not we have to pay for the charging cell phones. For little things, you have to pay for any, any little thing? Yep, the charging cell phone, um, they'll have to pay wherever they go. So if they go into the next city over, they charge as well. So we typically look at what's being charged in the area. And um, we thought when we initially rolled out kiosks that we could charge a higher price because of the convenience, right, that we're just down the street rather than having to spend four hours of your day walking to the next city. But we learned that if there's a cheaper price, they'll go for it. So now we tend to just match um, what the charging cost would be in the next city over, and it's on the order of 20 cents to charge your cell phone. So, yeah. another question? Which is a lot uh, less expensive than I work in uh, Central and South America, and when we polled people how they uh, charge their cell phones, 80% of the people said they would go to the bar. <laughs> so I'd say, well, how long does it take you to charge your cell phone, they said a beer and a half. <laughs> <laughs> 20 cents sounds a lot cheaper than <laughs> beer, yeah. Although beer is pretty cheap in Africa. Yeah, but. Yeah. I think you need to sell cold beer over there. <laughs> yeah. More questions? Um, what kind of wind turbines were those that you used in the one project? Uh, OK, so. Not knowing your background, I'll just, uh, they were uh, permanent magnet axial flux synchronous uh, wind turbines. And they were, uh, I don't know if you if you know the, this, uh, how well you know wind turbines, but Hugh Piggott is a pioneer of homemade wind turbines. So the company in Zambia, they kind of, or in Kenya, I should say, they had a modified version of that that they, that they constructed. Is that a AWP? African wind power. I think we, we know. Oh, the company we worked with is called uh, Power Gen. Okay. Yeah. yeah. There's there's actually a small Northwest connection as um, Hugh Pigott did training classes out on Weymouth Island. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, on that, so there's some of his designs out on Weymouth Island running. That are just, yeah. Similar. I think they're still generating power to this yeah. day, out there at the Anderson store, right at the ferry dock, and places like that. Okay, is it down? Uh, more questions? All right. Oh, we got one more. So vandalism isn't ha has that been an issue, um, or and or neighboring communities going, hey, we want that. I got so many stories to tell about vandalism in neighboring communities. Fortunately, they're not related to our projects. We haven't had any vandalism that I can't think of a single occurrence of it. I actually asked that same question to uh, vandalism and theft. I asked that same question to a room full of, of kiosk operators, and not one of them had panels stolen or anything like that. 
Um, but we also put in safety precautions, you know, to try to prevent that. So it, at our kiosk, for example, usually there's a night watch person who is paid to probably just sleep there, <laughs> but it discourages it. So theft hasn't hasn't been an issue. Neighboring community jealousy. Um, I can give you the full story maybe at the, the bar later tonight, but there was an issue in, <laughs> uh, that I heard about in Haiti where one kiosk was burnt down during a riot from a, a neighboring community. So it does happen, and you have to have to be careful about what you do. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Big round of applause for everybody. And if, if you want to come to one of our meetings, and the next one is um, – uh, a week from tomorrow at Seattle University at 7 p.m. Grab my business card or, or c contact anyone sort of sitting over there, and we can give you the details and you can get on our email list. So thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so now we're going to uh, do a quick review of the Solar Summit. Um, and we're going to do this little um, freestyle. Joan's going to start with one, one of the presentations, and I, we need to kind of let you know that all these presentations were given by someone else, um, so we're doing our best to, to go over the presentation and say what our key uh, our key thoughts were in it. Uh, so we've got a couple of our board members up here. We'll probably uh, chime in a little bit. Uh, who fr from the crowd? Who else uh, went to the Solar Summit? I see. Okay, so we got a few attendees here. Uh, if you see things that are interesting, go ahead and shout them out. I'll be running around with the mic, and we'll have this discussion here. So up is Joan. So my name is Joan Schrammick. I'm on the board of Solar Washington. I'm not Dave Nickel. He gave the presentation at the Solar Summit, but I will um, walk you through it. Um, before I dive right in, uh, which button do I push? <laughs> Just left or right? Okay. Okay. There. So before I dive into um, the the primary focus of the state of solar presentation was to talk about the state of the solar incentives and how they impact the people in Washington State. Um, so for anybody who is already works for a solar installation company, you already know this information. But for others in the audience, you might not know that the um, solar incentive law was passed in 2005, unanimous in our state legislature, which is kind of unheard of, started in 2005, and it created the production incentive. Um, so the solar panels sit on the rooftop. They generate electricity. It's measured on a production meter. So the kilowatt hours produced are measured on a production meter before, before it goes into the building. And individuals, homeowners or business owners, receive a per kilowatt hour incentive um, for those kilowatt hours once a year after a June 30th year end. June 30th is the state's budget year. It's a state incentive. So after the June 30th year end, you get a check. Um, the State Department of Revenue manages, pardon me, manages this program, but your utility manages it for you. Um, the production incentive payment rate is highest for made in Washington equipment. So solar panels and inverters made in Washington earn you the highest rate. Out-of-state equipment earns a lower rate. The highest rate is 54 cents a kilowatt hour for residential systems, and out-of-state equipment is 15 cents a kilowatt hour. There's other rates for other types of things um, that are not solar, but this is for the solar rates. Um, that incentive is called both a production incentive, a Washington State incentive, the state incentive, a Washington incentive, or a cost recovery incentive. But the whole point is to is a cost recovery to the person who bought the solar system and installed it. It was that was our state saying, "Let's go solar." And um, let's see. Okay. So Department of Revenue sent us this chart to show the growth of solar um, paid out on those um, year ends of June 30th every year. The last one, it says 615, but it's really 616. June, 6, June 30th, 2016 is the farthest right column. And it shows the growth of solar in our state um, and some numbers about it. This is on their website. You can go and look. But uh, they also gave us a little bit more information, which is for the state fiscal year, the state spent out $15 million and 41 utilities participated. 
uh, for the state's fiscal year. And then on a calendar year basis, again, 41 utilities in the most recent year, $17,000 is what they, um, if they had paid out checks at the end of the calendar year, that's what the checks would have been. They don't pay out checks until the end of June. Um, and so that kind of shows you that the difference between the first half of the year and the second half of the year is pretty significant. Second half of the year is um, usually a greater growth of solar. Question. Well, is it uninitiated? Uh, so this is just a regular out of the general fund state, uh, I mean, is there a funding source for this? Thank you. The source of the money is this the taxes that the utilities would be paying in, the public utility tax that the utilities pay to the state. And out of that money, 0.5% of each utility's taxes can be used for this program. And it, so it varies for each utility, each utility, but 0.5% of the taxes that they would have paid to the state based on their taxable sales for the year. Yes. Good question. When you get to, we're actually going to go into great detail about what happens when each utility reaches their cap, but that money is capped both to the individual, $5,000 a year to the individual or the homeowner or the business that goes solar, and then each utility has an upper cap, 0.5% of um, their taxable sales. Then when they reach that cap, they can either close their program and not let no new, more people in, or they can um, redistribute the money at a lower rate to all the customer generators, all the customers who generated kilowatt hours in the Renewable Energy Incentive Program. So we're going to walk through um, some examples of what different utilities have done, and that's part of the rest of this presentation. Thanks. I think a quick comment I'm going to point out on this is look at um, uh, 2012 versus 2015. Was there any growth in this industry? So that kind of shows what, what, why we've been trying to address these issues recently. So, hmm. did I do something? Working on the clicker. Okay. Um, and then here's just one more chart that again shows the growth of solar. This is by number of solar installations and it's um, done by WSU Energy Office from 2005 to 2015. It's the growth of solar and the dark blue is residential, the light blue at the very bottom of each bar is commercial, and then the dark red is community solar projects. Um, and then most recently just 2011 through 2015, so a closer up image shows you, again, um, where the solar is being installed is residential. And that's partly because of that $5,000 cap on the incentive. It really works best for a residential system. Community solar has its own whole set of rules and, and um, guidelines, which I'm not going to go into because it's a lot more complicated. Um, there are approximately, approximately 2,000 solar jobs in Washington. We know that from the Solar Foundation. And Dave Nickel put together some numbers. Based on the numbers that he uncovered, it cost the state, through that incentive program, about $7,300 per job, per solar job in Washington. By comparison, for um, Boeing, it costs about $450,000 per job based on state incentives to Boeing. Interesting. <laughs> Shows that our solar incentive program is very efficient. Here's where the solar jobs are in Washington, and um, the solar jobs on the left are, that's the density of solar jobs, and then population densities on the right, so it really does kind of line up. The jobs are in the, the majority of the jobs are in the densest populated areas. That makes sense. There's some additional statistics from 2015 on the Solar Foundation website if you want to have a closer look. It goes into a wide variety of information. Um, we know from the study that Solar Washington did 
that for every dollar in state in spent on the state incentive programs, two dollars and forty six cents comes back to our community in um, local is injected back into the local economy. Um, one of the things that we export is knowledge. So people come up through the solar programs and the incentive sponsored programs in Washington and take their knowledge out to other states. This is a picture of a solar system that Dave Nickel designed and installed in Alaska. It's the biggest solar system in Alaska, biggest solar array in Alaska. He was a student at the Shoreline program and then um, started his own company and now is designing and building solar systems. That's just one example, but there are many, many, many examples of us, of our state exporting our training and knowledge and understanding of solar. Um, currently, right now, the Joint Legislative Audit Review Committee is seeking input from people, from the public and from legislators on is the solar is the state incentive program working? Is it doing what it was set out to accomplish? And you can go on the, to the Solar Washington website, find this um, presentation, and follow the links. But it's JLARC is the name of the state legislative committee. They're going to be doing their work between now and the end of the year on how well is our state incentive program working to achieve its original goals. And its original goals were to provide incentives for the greater use of locally created energy technologies, re renewable energy technologies, and uh, supporting and retaining existing local industries and creating new opportunities for renewable energy industries to develop in Washington. Well, I think we know in this room that it has worked. Um, this is some of the graphics that come from the JLARC website, and uh, again, I encourage you to go and make a comment. When it, right now, it says that the state legislature should review and clarify the preference, preference meaning the incentive, um, and so they'll be looking at that at the recommendations in January when the state legislature reconvenes. They're doing the state incentive program now, but they're also going to do the sales tax exemption. In our state, solar is sales tax exempt if it's under 10 kilowatts of system size, or over 10 kilowatts, there's a 75% sales tax exemption. And so they're going to look at sales tax exemption next. Um, I'm going to jump from this because it's hard to read. Here are the utilities that have not reached their cap. There's a list of them that's included in this um, power PowerPoint on the Solar Washington website. I don't know if you can read them, but you can refer back if you're interested. And here's the ones that have reached their cap. On the left-hand side, they are, are the utilities that are reducing their incentives taking that same pool of money and spreading it out over all of the solar customer generators or renewable energy customer generators. And on the right hand side, once they reach their cap, these utilities decided to close their programs, not let new, ut new participants in and keep everybody who is in the program at the highest incentive rate. So two different ways of dealing with the fact that there's a cap. And you might remember, but the bill that we that we um, told you about last legislative session, HB 2346, one of the things that it would have done was raise the cap. Uh, oh, okay. So now we're going to run through the individual uh, examples from several different types of utilities, including PUDs, uh, municipal utilities, and um, investor, not inventor, investor-owned utilities. The first one is Pacific Power, investor-owned utility. Um, this is a little hard to see, but you see the growth of solar as in all the previous charts. The one at the bottom shows that the vast majority is residential. There's, the blue is commercial, and the red is for irrigation systems. This is Central Washington, Pacific Power. Um, their program cap was $1.7 million. In Washington, 
or they for wash made in Washington equipment they paid out at 54 cents a kilowatt hour this year for residential under 10 kilowatts of system size and very likely to reach the program cap in 2017 so by June 30th 2017 when they go to do their payout they expect to reach the cap and begin to reduce incentives so the next time they pay out money and that will continue on through the program end of June 30th 2020 that's when the whole program goes away completely. Bob. I better understand that. I think you're saying that a residential person can put still write off $5,000 of the price for the solar panel and then they would get like 50 cents or 43 cents whatever it is uh, per kilowatt that they generate. Is that correct? I'm not sure what you mean by write off. The maximum amount of money that they can get from the Washington State Incentive Program is $5,000, period. They can't get more than $5,000 in a check once a year. But because the utility reaches its cap, then everybody's incentive rate goes down. So instead of possibly, instead of $0.54 cents a kilowatt hour, it might be paid out at roughly oh, $0.40 cents a kilowatt hour. So nobody's check would be 50 uh, $5,000, everybody's checks would come down. Well, so if it cost you $20,000 for your solar panels and, and connections to put on your house, is the, fi the $5,000 isn't all you can get. Yeah, I mean, somehow you're supposed to get your money paid off. So the well, that, all right, there was federal tax credit that you would get in addition to the 5,000 per, per year. 5,000 per year through the end of the program, 2020. Okay, $5,000 per year. So if it's like eight years, why that's more than enough. But from net, right now, it's three and a half years from today, or from you know the end okay. of this year, it would be three and a half years left. If you were thinking about it today, getting into the solar program, it would be three and a half years left. Oh, then that would be the end of the program. Exactly, yes. And that's why we're fighting to get another law passed to continue the incentive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. This is Avista, another investor-owned utility. Um, they, had three, they have 362 systems right now. They paid out $694,000 in incentives on the last um, time they did payments, June 30th, 2016. Uh, they are, oh, up at the very top, amount of money remaining in their pool of money is $1.286 million. So they're about halfway to their cap, right? Uh, Puget Sound Energy, Leslie Moynihan is the manager there, net metering program manager there now. And in 2016, their production incentive limit, that's the dollar limit, uh, the 0.5% of their sale, taxable sales, was $10.05 million. And if they had paid everybody their, their, at the highest rate, it would have meant $10.4 million needed to be paid out. So they had to cut out some of that 10.4 to bring it down to 10.005. And for people who would have gotten 54 cents a kilowatt hour, they got 50.4 cents a kilowatt hour. Next year, it'll be lower. But this, and this chart also shows the growth of solar in that, for this utility. There you see it again, um, year-to-date 2016 is year-to-date September, so 2016 is going to keep growing on this chart. But it's that rapid growth, that giant growth of solar that's causing everyone to reach their caps, or lots of utilities to reach their caps. And as you know, PSE is the largest, uh, utility in, yard, largest utility in the state, and these are all the counties that they have solar systems in or that there are solar systems in. Next one's Tacoma Power. So now we're going to talk about a couple municipal power systems. 
Um, this is just some basic numbers. They have 270 of um, residential solar systems, 106 subscribers in community solar systems. Um, they have four different community solar systems in their solar within their area. Uh, they're, they're, they have $1.6 million to spend on the, on the incentives, and they are 39% of the way to their cap. They also have some solar systems that are not eligible for the production incentive that are some interesting places like Tacoma Solid Waste, for example. Here's where you can find more information on Tacoma Power. Uh, and this one is the City of Richland. City of Richland uh, reached their cap earlier this year and closed the program entirely to new participants. This chart shows the, um, again, the bar graph of growing solar um, installations. And 2016, I think, is, oh no, this is through June 30th, 2016. The blue dots are the number of customers. The bars are the dollars that they spent on the incentive program. And this shows what 2016 calendar year and 2017 calendar year would look like if they um, didn't cap their incentive. But it is capped in terms of number of dollars. Uh, numbers of customers on this one. Okay, this is Seattle City Light, and that's Dave Nichols' personal solar system on his home. He's a Seattle City Light customer. Um, basic numbers, payment rate in 2016, can I do the red dot? Ah, there, payment rate in 2016, 72.5%. Uh, so when they reached their cap, they reduced it down to everyone and they paid out at about 72.5% in 2016. Uh, Seattle City Light, this, this uh, slide is really interesting because it shows the panels that were made out of state and the panels that were made in state. Out of state is the blue, in state is the orange color. And of course, in most recent years, since iTech started making panels in 2011, there's a huge growth of made in Washington systems. And it shows on this slide that the cost per kilowatt of system capacity for out of state in the blue and in state made in Washington in the orange are the same today based on system prices in Seattle City Light. Um, based on the data that's been provided to Seattle City Light uh, from their customers. So uh, Made in Washington used to cost more, but not any longer. And then this one just shows that Seattle City Light came up to its cap and didn't go over the eligible funds that they had to spend. In the early years of the program, they had lots of money that didn't get used, but now it's all used. Jefferson County PUD, so we're going to switch to some PUDs briefly. Um, Jefferson County, 2014, oops, paid 100%. 2015 paid at 70%. 2016, they paid at 61.53%. It'll be lower next year. Um, Snohomish County PUD. Uh, the orange are Solar Express projects and the blue are are non-Solar Express. Solar Express is when you qualify because you use a may, um, because you use a registered Snohomish PUD installer, then you get an extra bonus. That PUD there pays you up to two thousand dollars in a rebate, a cashback rebate. So the orange ones got the rebate, the others didn't. Um, and 2016 is only a partial year on this on this chart. As of 9-1-2016, they had in their area, 8.1 megawatts of customer-generated solar and other renewable energy. Uh, 
System size is probably the most interesting thing on this slide, which is 2015, 7.3 kilowatts of system size was the average. It's now 7.8. So with falling prices, the size goes up. And in 2016, P, uh, Snohomish PUD was at 87% of the 87% of the weight of their cap. So next year they will start reducing incentives, incentive payment rates. And that's a contact person. Oh, one more, Clark PUD. This is really hard to see, but it's again the same growth of solar. And they are at 70% of their cap, it looks like. Oh, no, wait. I think, didn't Clark PUD close their program? I, they I did. thought they did close. They closed their program um, entirely to new participants. But the other thing that they did is that they have a big community solar pro program there, and they would have needed to pay out more than their cap and they decided to make up the difference with Clark PUD money. And so everybody gets the incentive rate that they thought they were going to get when they joined the program. Um, and through 2020, then Clark PUD is going to make up the difference. But nobody new can get into the program. That's a really nice model for the rest of the state. Okay, the other thing we wanted to kind of think about was who all is in the solar state of solar in Washington? And it includes a lot of manufacturers. So Outback Power, Midnight Solar, Magnum Energy, uh, Pure Solar is a new Made in Washington certified panel manufacturer, uh, Blue Frog Solar, Microinverter Maker, iTech Energy, everyone knows, I think has shipped 175,618 units since September 2011, as of September this year. And a unit's a solar panel. Good. I don't, I don't know why we called it units. <laughs> I wasn't the one that did that. Uh, REC Solar is in Moses Lake. Here's a headline saying it was closing. Uh, and then here's another headline saying it's resuming operation. Um, we just like to think about solar in the biggest sense. Uh, and there's a picture of Dave. Questions? Questions? Should we have more slides? <laughs> that was a great presentation, really interesting to see the uh, the growth. So in Seattle, it, it seems like um, if you're already in this program, you, uh, from an economic perspective, you don't want other people to join because it reduces the rate. Is that, am I interpreting that correctly? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that would be right. Also, you want everyone to lobby their state legislator to get a new program. Right. So it's, it will expire, you said, in three years? The existing program ends in 2020, June mm -hmm. 30th, 2020, regardless of anything else. Okay. Uh, I'll ask another question. Mm -hmm. um, has anybody looked at like the, the cost per installed watt in Washington State versus other places where they don't have such a strong incentive program? And what do you know what that comparison might look like? We heard about monster data. Yeah. But I don't have it right. Okay. I don't know it off the top of my head. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We can find it. Um, when the utility didn't use their allotted funds in the early years, what happened to that money? Can they spread it over the next years or is it, you know? They don't get to spend it in the next years and it stays in the state budget. It stayed in the state budget. It's gone. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about what the community solar projects are about? Um, sure. The idea with community solar is lots of participants putting in a little bit of money and buying a big system. Um, so an example is on the Seattle Aquarium, but there's different financial models for creating it. It can either be sponsored by a utility, and then the utility manages it, or it could be sponsored by an LLC, but the location has to be on a public building, a public owned building. So, and then also the highest dollar rate was a dollar eight. It was double the 54 cents. 
$1.8 per kilowatt hour could go to, for example, the LLC. And the LLC would then have subscribers who earned their money back after they put it in. Um, with only three and a half years left, in the program today, nobody's doing, nobody's starting new community solar projects. Oh, there's a community solar project right here at Finney Center. Nice. The upper building. And so Finney Center is a public building. Was it an LLC that did it, or was it part of some utility or city-sponsored program? Seattle City Light did it, correct? Yeah. So Seattle City Light is a municipal um, utility, and so they sponsored it. So the, yeah, the zoo. The, mm -hmm. If there is an open Seattle City Light uh, community solar program, it's on the Seattle City Light website for sure. You can find out about it. I don't know if there's an open one right now or if they filled up. I don't know if anybody else knows. Okay. I, it's more it's more a remark than a question. I, um, when you when you hit, hit the cap, uh, do you see or do the installers see more um, off-grid solar? installed. Uh, I, I know that's a big debate now in Germany um, where people think of it maybe more in central Washington, not so much in um, or eastern Washington. The incentive program the requires that it be grid tied. Yeah, so, so, so off-grid off -grid would really be in a different category, not through the incentive program, but it certainly is happening either in remote areas where there is no grid or potentially through people leaving the grid. I, I don't think there's a number. I don't think anybody keeps track. Right. And yeah, I guess uh, Washington will probably be one of the last states to have grid deflection because we have cheap power and but the Hawaii's and the Germany's and California's and Nevada will probably start chasing away people and creating that. So. Got a question back here. So my question's more of a confirming my memory of how the system works. So the 5,000 cap is only on the productive part of the energy coming in. Any excess energy that your house doesn't use that gets tied back to the grid doesn't count for that 5,000, right? Um, let's see, can we go back to slide one or two? I didn't really go into the net metering part on this diagram, but the, there are two separate meters. So the production meter measures all the kilowatt hours produced by the solar system. You get a check for every kilowatt hour if you are a residence that has solar, up to your cap. On the net meter, that's a two-way meter that measures electricity both directions, from your utility that you owe your utility a fee for, and then from you, anytime you have excess, your excess electricity goes to the utility, and under Washington net metering laws, you earn retail rate credits for the electricity that goes to the utility. So in Western Washington, summertime, we earn lots of net metering credits, and in the darker days of winter, we spend our net metering credits. That necess isn't necessarily true in eastern Washington, but for western Washington, that wa model works really well. The net metering year ends June thir uh, April 30th. It ends and it zeroes out, and you start a new year. 
So what we were saying about sizing your solar system, you can't become a net power producer and get a check at the end of the year where you're generating electricity to make money. It's really just that you can cover your load, you can cover your use, and you always have to pay the monthly minimum fee, whatever it is for your utility. You're always receiving whatever your price per kilowatt hour on the production side, regardless of what your usage is in the house, regardless of what your net metering is in terms of what's going out, what's coming back, you're always making that when you're producing. Exactly. So exactly. potentially if you aren't if you didn't if you were producing and your house was completely off, you'd get your production and you'd get the retail rate on everything that was going out of your house and into the grid. Well, no, because you don't get a check at the end of the year. You get to use that electricity, but you don't yeah. get a check at the end of the you're, year. Right, right. The yeah. check is only on the production side. But right. theoretically, you're getting, you'll get that back as you use it when you come home and turn. You get a double, mm -hmm. you get a double yeah. dip. Right. You, you, bank credits all, uh, you bank credits all year up and, and spend the credits up right. until April 30th. It zeroes out. Okay. Yeah. And then I had another question. Yeah. I was curious about the mindset of the utilities for those who say, yeah, we'll spread, this, we'll, we'll spread this pie out among more people versus those that say, nope, once you're in, that's it, nobody else gets to play. It's sort of, um, it's a really difficult position for them to be in because, and that's one of the reasons why so many utilities supported the bill that was in the state legislature last year because they had those original customers in the early years who bought an expensive system, some of them with loans, and then expected to go all the way to 2020 at that rate of 54 cents a kilowatt hour. The, the utility encouraged them to go solar at that rate, and then they, the utility feels somewhat responsible for them making that decision up front to do it. So they want to keep them whole. But at the same time, if they cut off the program to everyone else, then no one new gets in. It's a difficult situation. If new people do want in, if they cut, them, cut everybody off, the solar installer's work goes away. So yeah, it's a really tough choice. And um, HB 2346 would hopefully fix that. Right. The original bill from 2005 was basically written this way, and it was there was the vagueness in it. didn't. There was no requirement for people to, to extend the program or to cut back, but there was a DOR ruling that said they couldn't just throttle back the rate on certain people. They had to spread it across all participants in, one, in the utility if they do hit the cap. So that's why new participants as well as old participants got paid the same rate. So, you know, the old, the old bill from 2005 is kind of like a book that was written 90% done. The last chapter is missing and the last chapter explains how to ramp down the program and that's what the next bill for last year and hopefully for this year, we'll carry that through and now we can write the last chapter of the book and carry on there. Having been at the summit and listened to the panels that had several utility representatives on it, that I just, what Joan started to say it there, the utilities were pretty loud and clear that they felt uncomfortable being put in the position of having to make that decision. It's like that's the position, that, that should be a government decision. It shouldn't be a, especially the for-profit ones, <laughs> felt very uncomfortable. So. Exactly. We've got another presentation coming up, but more questions on this one? Like I said, we're gonna add more slides for the next time we play it. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Joan. Great. So, Craig Olson, um, I just, I'm a new retiree and I decided to, uh, with the time I'm supposed to have, I decided one of the things I'd like to work on is advocating for getting off of fossil fuels. So, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> live up uh, Mount Vernon and uh, I met Joan through uh, getting a, a system installed which was uh, sized at the size that will produce that 10 kilowatt hours a year. What's the number? 10 something. 10,000. Yes. So because if you go beyond that then you don't get the sales tax re uh, uh, cut off and you also you're going to overproduce and so you're, any overproduction 
on that net meter, then you just zero out. You don't get money for that. At the end, you've just given power to the uh, the utility, but you haven't gotten paid for it. So um, anyway, so I met Joan there, and one and Joan leads one thing to the next until yeah, I'm standing here. So. Uh, and that is up there. So, is that the one? No. Yeah. It is? Yes, okay. Um, so I said yes, okay, I'll, I'll go through these uh, few slides on this presentation. We were, the original idea of this presentation at the summit was for, okay, what's ha happening outside of Washington? But uh, George, and you say his last name for me, Bondorf? Yes, okay. Uh, he decided to essentially focus that on what's happening in the commercial uh, direction, in other words, companies outside of Washington. And I, that, I like, the, this one really captivates me because uh, I think there's so much available. Uh, I, I mean, I think that's where a lot of the solar installation and the solar generation in this country needs to go, even in Western Washington. And in prepare, helping pre, uh, prepare for this summit, uh, one of my jobs was trying to recruit talks. And, and I got to a really good chat with IKEA as an example. Uh, they're building a new store in Renton, tearing down their old one and uh, building a new one. The, that store then is in the same vein that they're doing worldwide, which is they want to, uh, they have said that we want to be globally a, uh, we pr make the same amount of uh, energy that we use. And so all new stores are being covered with uh, solar on the roof, and that's what is happening in Renton. And once that's built, you can go down there and see it. Um, <laughs> they weren't able to come talk at the summit, but uh, it was a good, getting to talk to them about that uh, philosophy. And it's, it's just a corporate philosophy that they decided to do globally. You know, Sweden is, it tends to be on the front edge of making those kind of decisions. Um, uh, so, I guess I'm going to yes. do a quick interruption, a quick yes. hats off to IKEA for doing uh, yeah. uh, the largest solar array in Washington State. So, uh, be is. sure to go down there. Be sure to go down there and buy us. Uh, Yeah, so I'm going to buy a lot more furniture yes. and yeah. switch yes. meatballs from them. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so they're going to they're going to be um, ha be able to wave that flag that we have installed the biggest commercial uh, installation up until somebody else beats them. But I mean, just to me, it's common sense. How many businesses are there with flat roofs out there that are covered with um, you know? waterproofing and air conditioning units and that kind of thing. And I mean, there is a lot of space. You don't need to go out and put this out on a piece of ground somewhere. There's a lot of roof space. And uh, th another thing that just makes sense to me anyway is uh, it, people talk about, well, the solar demand, uh, you know, solar production is really, it's only in the daytime and it, uh, you know, it's proportional to the heat and the weather and that kind of thing. Well, the big demand in a lot of these installations is air conditioning, and so that's tied exactly, very closely with when the solar panels are productive. Um, makes a lot of sense, and it, they could just plain reduce their bills by a lot. So um, anyway, th what this is about is there's a lot of companies that are, for reasons other than incentives, uh, are making the and making the leap. Um, this is an example article that um, George presented that just the paragraph there and uh, it's said better than I would say it so I'm, you can read it, I'm going to read it with you but um, this is from June, corporate demand for renewable energy. Um, Facebook and Microsoft are among 60 companies and that's actually more than 60 now. Um, service providers participating in a new network of the renewal Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance. So the businesses are starting to form alliances to make this sort of thing happen, um, to break down barriers to low carbon energy. They want to get to, they put, you know, everybody picks a target. So their target that they picked is uh, 60 gigawatts by 2025. A huge jump from the three gigawatts of renewable power purchases that companies are making in uh, last year. Um, 
Uh, there's another uh, article here that I just took a couple paragraph excerpt out of that I'd like to read to you because, again, it's written better than I would say it. <laughs> Apple becomes a green energy supplier with itself as a customer. This is in the New York Times in the middle of August. Uh, like other big companies before it, including Walmart and Google, Apple recently received a federal designation for its energy subsidiary that allows it to become a wholesale re or seller of electricity from coast to coast. Apple has contracted with First Solar to begin buying a little less than half of the power uh, later this year, that would be 2016, from the California Flats installation. Um, it's a solar energy farm now under construction. Under the terms of the deal, Apple will pay $850 million for the electricity over 25 years and receive the farm's total outfit, output by the end of the agreement. Apple's move comes as prices for renewable energy continue to plummet. Signing long-term contracts allows businesses to shield themselves from potentially higher, more volatile charges from a power company. Apple wouldn't say how much is paying for the California Flats energy, but expected the company to save hundreds of millions of dollars over the life of the contract. Large company, corporate executives face increasing pressure from shareholders and customers to show that they are doing their part to fight climate change. At the same time, corporate energy use has exploded, driven in many cases by the ravenous demands of the data cloud. <laughs> um, so these are just a couple examples. Uh, IKEA is another one, uh, but it's it's a it's a big it's starting to be a movement. The pendulum starting to swing. Uh, it, regulations are not you know the regulatory structure for utilities and sort of aren't really built to handle this kind of thing, um, and that's why they're forming these. Uh, um, there it is. Those kind of alliances, um, and there's a bunch of others as well. So um, let's see what the next. Yeah, so there's some of the that list there. It keeps on going. Um, like I said, that's more than 65. You see IKEA there, but um, a lot of companies are jumping on this to various degrees. Uh, some of them are just putting their toes in. Some of them are wholly committed. Um, Here's more again. You, I don't know if you can't really read company names there, but it's the same company names and it's just sort of showing um, bar graph. 2016 obviously isn't complete. Um, I'm going to hang on to that one first. Well, no. Uh, so what? Uh, this is essentially what corporations are really after in doing this. They want choice. They want to be able to choose renewable power instead of just buying what the utility has to sell. In other words, they, they're big customers. They want to say, I, I, I as a customer, you know, I've got customers are saying, what are you doing? And so now I as a customer are saying, what, I need choices here. I need renewable choices. They need it to be cost competitive because obviously as a business you can't really just be donating a whole bunch of extra money to uh, renewables. And then um, you need lo the long-term pricing is, is stability essentially is what that is. And bu uh, budgeting is a huge issue for companies. Um, access to new, whoops, not that button. Um, access to new projects that reduce energy emissions. So it, it tends to be that newer projects are less, are more efficient and so they're desirable. Um, um, this is um, more options from utilities and regulators. So they're trying to drive this cooperation of like, how do we move this forward? Because the environment, it, you know, all the regulations weren't built to handle this new model. And so we've got to get some uh, needing to push on that. Uh, and then financial tools, financing, that sort of thing. Um, that's still new country as well. Um, and then, so this is kind of the model. A green tariff, took me a second to realize, figure out what that is because I'm not used to it, but I am a PSE customer and I've been, they started a green power um, option years ago that we signed up for and so we are at this point uh, our whole bill goes to renewable energy through PSE because I can designate that. It costs just, I don't know, four or five, ten dollars a month more 
something like that. But this is essentially the same thing. It's where a company, a, uh, as a customer, says, um, um, I want to specifically designate my money going to, uh, uh, you know, to renewable energy. And, but then what this uh, Apple thing was talking about and some of the others um, is what they're doing is they're saying, I'm going to make a contract with somebody who's going to make, the, you know, I just have a contract straight with the supplier. And the u function of the utility then becomes the conduit. And I'm not sure what the utility is making off of this, but they must be making something because it costs to have the infrastructure. But uh, I think this this looks like a model that is definitely being pushed at the moment. I don't know how big it will end up getting. PSC, uh, George said that PSC has 10 of these relationships with large users in, in PSC's area, for example, Boeing, where uh, the, the contract between Boeing and PSE, um, eh, actually I'm misspeaking there. It's called open access and it's, it, it allows Boeing to buy the, their power more like a, um, at a at a wholesale rate, I think is what it is. Um, I think that is all. I'm, I'm up to questions. So. Any questions here? So I just say, I think, I'm excited to see this. about amplifying that whole, uh, instead of green power, you, green tariff, you called it something else. They're thinking of replicating that model in the residential market. Did they say anything at the solar summit about uh, giving options to their customers that would be within the utility versus the options offered now, which are external, the um, installers pitch the pitch the uh, pitch the product, the installation, and uh, do the work, and PSC turns around and uh, you know pays the cons cons the uh, customer generator. So, are they thinking of of any relationships with their customer generators, or any of the investor utilities looking to have that model in Washington State, or what does it look like in other states? If that's a better question, yeah. I don't remember. Uh, I don't remember specifically. Yeah. I don't. Bigger projects. I mean, I think really the the scope was or scale was much larger than residential or small business. Or. But you just made a light bulb go off for me anyway. Thank you. <laughs> that you know, um, that's almost that's almost like a community solar thing. I mean, are the utilities looking at these, you know, the it'll be hugely increasing still a uh, number of solar generators. As in other words, my if I'm if I'm paying for green power to PSE, and they have contracts with wind, you know, they're do producing wind. They have biogas, uh, you know, biogas, uh, that kind of thing. Well, they're also getting a whole bunch of solar panels in there. You know, I mean, could my dollars go to pay for uh, pay somebody who's generating on the roof? And that's actually it's kind of like a form of community solar that way, where the gen <laughs> where the people who bought solar panels could actually get paid by PSE instead of getting zeroed out, because other people are saying, you know, in other words, it's a green resource that PSE could tap into. Anything else? Any other questions there? We're going to go on to our next presentation. And thank you, Craig. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah. I think we're going to, uh, we're going to go through this one kind of quick, but um, I'm going to ask for any help from the board, fellow board members and other att attendees of the summit to uh, just comment on things that you saw important on it. Um, there were some interesting, um, definitely some eye-opening numbers that were in this presentation. Um, again, I am not from the Northwest Power Conser and Conservation Council, um, but I will try my best here to go through uh, one by one on their, their key slides here. Um, I think many people saw this this graph and it was kind of eye-opening to see 
where where our power consumption is going. Um, there were, um, uh, despite despite the growth in the in the region. Um, I just th drove through Ballard the other day. I, you know, I, I live up in Mount Vernon uh, as well, and driving through Ballard, uh, it's an interesting to see how quick it changes uh, month by month. And but the interesting part is conservation, um, energy conservation has been holding down our power demand uh, at relatively low rates, or excuse me, low, low um, growth rates, despite our population. Um, so the, um, uh, there's something called the, uh, let's see, what's, what's the proper name, the regional power plan? There's a sixth generation power plan, now I think we're, we're now on the seventh. Um, so you can kind of see the, um, the post six power plan, the path that it's going, um, I got to figure out my, my pointer on this. There we go. Um, so anyways, that's, this is the trend of power plan that is expected. Uh, I did? <laughs> I'll let you run it. He's going to point for me. Um, but that's the red line. The green shows that we start adding um, energy efficiency in the, in the plan. Um, and uh, there were some obvious things that, that are in here that we don't, that don't quite show up as electric cars. Do you need to use the laser? That one. That one. The, other, the other was the eject button. Yeah, don't Th throws me out of the room. <laughs> throws me out of the room by a bouncer uh, that does audio visual. No. Um, so anyways, there's a lot of uh, uh, curves that have not been calculated in here yet. The electric car, um, I think the right word is revolution. Um, we have a tremendous amount of electric cars showing up in the Pacific Northwest. That's going to change these graphs a little bit. Um, okay, I got to press the right button. Um, but they spend a lot of time calculating where, where growth is going at different, um, different consumption rates. Um, but you can see that we kind of have a, a flat rate in, in consumption generally, or sh shown by the medium, median line there, that only if we have some uh, radical changes would be electrical cars changing that, um, yet more conservation uh, brings the line down there. So uh, it isn't necessarily just adding a lot more solar, it's also just looking in there's power plants that are being retired in the line. Um, uh, they obviously have a certain amount of life, so they can can be replaced by solar. But we do have uh, load profiles that we got to match. Um, I'm going to get my buttons right here. Um, but there are clearly concerns. They're trying to match. Um, what we don't want to have happen is to overload the grid in, in events where we have too many electric cars charging on a cold winter day trying to get trying to get preheated before our commutes in the morning um, so they do spend a lot of time forecasting what the loads will look like um, uh, and I'm trying to remember the key ones does anyone else have some key comments on these while I'm going through them so there's a lot of um, planning that we need to do um, there are examples where um, they are definitely looking in to re eliminating uh, the coal plants in Centralia, in, in Montana. Uh, different examples of what's the chances that we would have um, a, uh, an event where we end up losing circuits or something like that, let's say an overload. LLP, what we figured out what that was, a loss of load, loss of load probability. Yep, okay. Um, I lived in California for a year. <coughs> went down there for a job and then I got introductions to rolling blackouts and we were having to turn off our turn off equipment, manufacturing equipment in the middle of the day because they were worried about rolling blackouts. Um, conservation helped give them some time, they're still having issues. Um, but it's the same case of what they're looking here. Um, we're not that far away from um, um, basically uh, su succeeding functionally that we don't need a, uh, additional coal plants going in, or I should say keeping coal plants on longer than we should there. Um, 
I'm going to pass on this one, but this did show just basically definitely CO2 emissions are being monitored or being considered in the power plan. Um, there's something that's interesting that when you look into Washington um, that, you know, we are a very hydro rich state um, that does change the equation in Washington. Um, I, I watched a lot that's happening in California and Arizona and uh, Hawaii. They have different power needs, but there are some issues in, in Washington where there's a value of, or what is the value of solar being added to it, added to the utility grid? Um, one of the key issues that I noticed in here, and I've heard this before, was we have heavy spring runoffs. Um, so power could, we have almost too much power during our um, our spring months, but then you know we we have a lot of questions asked on you know is climate change going to affect uh, stored energy there uh, coming off coming down the Columbia, um, but it does show what's the value of each source of energy. So solar um, uh, has less benefits during the winter months, but obviously during the summer months when our air conditioners, as we start to use them more, because we, we get spoiled by our, our uh, mini split heat pumps, um, solar starts to add more and more value there. Again, they are all looking at each, each source of technology, their energy efficiency, the different values that it adds. Natural gas, unfortunately, still is in the game. Um, it has the ability to replace some of the coal. Um, we'd like to find ways that we can slow down that desire for it to work. Um, but the key thing I see on this is from a capacity or a capacity contribution, solar is not that far from natural gas there. Um, there's another graph coming up that really kind of drives that point. Um, that's the, this one here. Um, it's a little bit busy. But it shows what's the uh, real levelized cost of energy. Um, on this end of the scale here, we have basically doing your energy efficiency programs, changing out your changing out your 13 watt compact fluorescent for a 11 watt LED. I just got done putting a bunch of LED fixtures in my house, um, inking out the um, one by one old older fluorescents on it. So that's easiest thing to do. Um, Although I was trying to figure out, oh, okay. There is, uh, does anyone remember what T and D credit is? I can't remember. Transmission and distribution. Okay, transmission and distribution credits. Um, so energy efficiency without those transmission credits are a little less. But the interesting part, the next cheapest source of energy, and I was shocked by this for being a Washington number, was solar um, low cost installed in actually in southern Idaho. Um, why Southern Idaho? It's still on the transmission, readily available transmission lines that are already, already there, already the infrastructure's there. Again, Southern Idaho because it had better solar resources than Eastern Washington on that. So to me, that was a shock to see the Northwest can actually say that solar is the cheapest form of energy out there now. Um, natural gas, and I forget all my numbers, combined cycle, something turbine. Um, now, this is not, not necessarily showing the, or it does show the, the cost of the capital is the blue line. Uh, the fuel mix is the, fuel mix and transmission is the next lines here. So obviously a natural gas combined cycle turbine is cheaper than buying solar modules at their rapidly declining rates. But the fuel cost on natural gas is, is a big chunk of the, of the pie here. Um, but as you work through even, you know, here's wind, um, looks like from Montana. Uh, again, as we go through all the other sources, um, but the key key part here was it was eye opening to see that solar is now becoming cost competitive as it's crept its way up, you know, from the southern latitudes and crossing at least into southern Idaho right now. How come there is no comparison against oil? When I look around in my city, there are lots of homes that have oil furnaces, and I don't see any comparison with oil. Uh, good question. I think um, this numbers, these numbers are from uh, electrical generation as opposed to heating generation on that. But in Hawaii, they're, 
they they use their you know they bring ship oil in to run the the gensets over there. So um, I guess to put that in perspective, Hawaii is about forty cents a kilowatt hour off of crude crude oil. So if that line was here, um, make sure I don't hit the eject button. That number would be way up here at the ceiling, probably for the price of um, uh, fuel oil fired uh, generation. It's partly why there's the huge revolution of solar in Hawaii is just it's so cost competitive right now. Um, so anyways, uh, the seventh power plan, uh, Joan said she could read that document in five hours. Um, I think it takes me five days. I'd say <clears throat> these documents are very, um, very in depth on the power planning for the for the Northwest region. Uh, if you want to read on them, uh, they are here at these uh, at this website here, I believe. And um, if you really want to, if you really want to kind of get a bigger idea of what's the, the big picture in energy for the Northwest. Um, I've, I've looked there and I have fallen asleep trying to read it on my computer. Um, there's definitely a lot on there. And do we have any additional slides? We did want to do that. Okay. Okay. You can tell I did not do this presentation during the summit. So, um, anyways, here, here's one of those interesting uh, chunks of information we've got. Um, you can see we are, we are very much the hydro-rich uh, region. Uh, coal still is fairly up there. If you're on Seattle City Light, some of the PUD webs, PUD um, uh, energy, you, you're not buying much coal. If, uh, but um, excuse me, on, on PUDs, PSE I think is 36 percent coal, if I remember the numbers right. Um, that kind of gives an overview. You know, it's interesting. You know, wind. We didn't have wind 10 years ago, and it's like, where did it come out of nowhere? Um, uh, and then basically base load, which is natural gas that's running all the time, and then peaking plants that are uh, gen sets that fire up uh, to match demand there. All right, um, here's some examples of what's uh, currently under our power plants that are being proposed for the region. Um, definitely a lot of wind. Um, a lot of solar, which is um, nice to see. Pumped hydro is, uh, or pump storage is basically hydro that's pumped into reservoirs and then used functionally as a battery. Um, we, we still have nukes in there. Um, but it's interesting to see uh, other forms of power, especially coal, being a complete flat line there. Um, we're going to have to try to do something with natural gas. Um, I work, you know, I work for iTech Energy, so I definitely watch the, the solar module industry. Um, the this year, there's been a significant price drop in modules generally worldwide. Almost a, um, you know, we're probably we're seeing modules that are probably dropping to two thirds the price at the beginning of the year. There's definitely some some dropping in prices, so that's going to change this equation to bump that up. And depending on what the price of natural gas does, that may move out there. Um, i trying to remember this graph was, these were projects that were terminated. Is that correct? These were, I think these were the, yeah, there's some that were, listed. so definitely the power plant is changing, and again, it's economics. What's the price of natural gas? What's the price of solar? What's the price of functioning fiberglass or wind? Um, and citing those sites there. And next slide was a detail, wasn't it? Yep. Yep. Um, do we have a detail of that one slide? I don't think we did. So. Okay. Um, but anyways, again, for the Northwest region, it's impressive to see that we've got solar being considered more, more and more for the, for the Northwest region. Um, 75 megawatts installed capacity now. Um, and more more coming online here. And again, what's that? Yeah, yeah. So actually, if, if um, it, we're we're very hydro rich, but here's a good example of just the variability of climate. Um, uh, I live on a 
uh, forested area, I have some trees that are probably a couple hundred year olds that I've have been remnant, I've cut them in half. And it's interesting, you can actually see the ring growths that actually do mirror this. So there are times that you might plan for a, a good hydro year and then end up with a, wider, a water shortage. Um, and considering we get our, generate our power from hydro, we do need to look at our smarter alternatives there. So. And, yep, that's the end of this slide. We put all those slides in the first presentation Joan did, so. Um, any questions that we've got? Any other comments from people that were at the summit? Specifically, just in general, we'll open this into more of a general conversation, so. Yeah, I'm going to take advantage to say one more thing. Well, just on that last thing you said, the the hydro, you know, with global warming, it's predicted that this region is going to have more pineapple expresses, which is to say, um, heavy dumps of of water. And we, at least in Washington, PSE and Seattle City Light and Tacoma and those, they uh, they have to dump a lot of that water uh, because I mean they hope to be able to store it, but they they actually have to get rid of it faster than they can generate sometimes. So um, the reservoirs aren't quite big enough for huge events. <laughs> and then, and then uh, but the other thing I was going to say is there's a presentation uh, for those of you who, uh, you know, are fans of trying to help people who aren't as well off economically um, in, the, in the price that they have to pay. Anyway, um, one of the talks was on the um, solar the potential for solar installations in Indian country in this country. Uh, um, and the current administration, Obama's, has set up quite a, a program that's quite a few million dollars. Uh, it's a very, it's a big program, it has quite a, a lot of money, and it is making quite a bit of effort to, um, to uh, talk to and communicate with the Indians and get projects going on the reservations. And I just wanted to say that uh, it's interesting that when our country put Indians on the reservations, a lot of times they put them on reservations that were like less valuable land, but now there's a new, a lot of them are on, uh, have a new resource, which is solar, uh, is one of the things they do have, and so they, some, a bunch of them are probably going to become exporters. Yeah, let's hope we don't rechange our treaty laws and grab that land back. and. So, it'd be crazy. No. I was there any conversation about the leasing side? You know, you, we've we've mentioned uh, like um, IKEA. I'm assuming they're putting that system on their roof for themselves, as opposed to somebody else putting that on there and then selling them the power. Uh, was was that uh, issue brought up at all at the summit of, of kind of the leasing programs? I'm not aware of that happening much in Washington. Um, actually, I don't recall anyone bringing up leasing. Uh, leasing's been that one interesting. Solar City definitely had a boom and raced off with it. Um, and it, actually, the one thing that was interesting on previous um, previous years showing the price of power is Solar City kind of got themselves in a little bit of trouble by charging too much or saying they charged a certain amount to install a solar panel on a roof, and then they charged they took that federal tax credit at 30 percent, and that went into the company to fund projects. Well, they were, seemed like they were overinflating their values because the states that had the most amount of solar, California, had the, one of the highest install costs, in which was solar. Um, they, the economics haven't brought them up here in the way the, uh, the way the 2005 incentive was written, they didn't qualify on that because they had to be a system owner, couldn't be a lease. So they were definitely trying to change the program to accommodate a solar city program, but the interesting part, solar city is clearly changing from a leasing model to an installation model and selling their service. So leasing is kind of one of those, I, I really question that can it go any further. I remember when it first came out, it's like, that doesn't make any sense. And then start digging into it. Okay. That's how they're, they're getting, they're financing their work off the tax credit. But yeah, IKEA is the project's coming out of their pocket doing it. You wanna you wanna go up to the? Sure. Uh, it's eight o'clock, so let's uh, we'll do yep. one more question and then wrap it up. Well, and and this isn't that important, but just somebody brought up Solar City, so I just was one. And you work for iTech, and mm -hmm. you know, in current events, Elon Musk just had this big reveal of these beautiful roofs with you know the solar panels hidden. What I mean, do you have any 
comment on that? I guess I would be interested to hear. Um, it made it made for good news. Um, I, I, actually, I didn't even see the presentation, so it actually took. Um, but clearly, they're they're trying to get out and do some clever work. Um, all credits to them on how to get how to create more and more solar that's out there. Uh, if they're integrating into red tile roofs down in California, that's just going to open the market even more. So they're doing some smart stuff. Um, I think they've, yeah, my gut feel is they've, they're, they're seeing the, the reality of the change of the leasing model. Just It worked for a while, but it isn't really sustainable in the future. You know, we now have modules that are credible and they do last, so why not, why not own them there? So, so basically, you're just confused about the details of that the leasing uh, say, say that again. I, I, a lot of the comment I've seen in the press is that, that there were no details in that. Like, right. you know, what is, does this mean Solar City is going to become a roofing company? Like, what mm -hmm. is going on? And it sounds like you're just as in the, I mean, you don't have any insight in particular. Right. The details of, there's there's always the, the big the big announcement, but what's really behind the, the announcement, there's a lot of the data that's missing there to really understand how they're going to do this, but... Um, actually seeing product come to fruition in the marketplace, it's going to take a while, but I think like what you're kind of inferring is like if anybody's going to figure out how to make it work, Elon Musk can figure out how to make these things work. Um, but it's not it's not easy to do like the roofing tiles. Um, I know companies that have tried and um, it's a challenge the module their cells are inefficient and they don't they aren't very durable. So they're having a hard time figuring out how to make that work. Um, Yep. Yeah, definitely hats off to um, Elon Musk and the challenges because I think it was in Who Killed the Electric Car or whatever, there was kind of a little snippet of Elon Musk trying to get the converted Tesla or converted Lotus Roadsters, you know, try to get that company running and it just looks like they're going to just tank. And it was like they pulled it off and what's the best cars in the world right now? It's Tesla. So, Logan, I'm going to be a nice guy and give you a question. <laughs> and then no, we'll wrap it up. All right, so this is only loosely related because you're talking about uh, the roofing tiles. Um, the, did you read the thing about uh, uh, Tesla Motors and their new solar roofing tiles that were like 98 is uh, proficiency or efficiency as panels and are more durable than standard roofing? Yeah, it's again in the details. I'm not really sure what they, how they announced it and, you know, they're doing their marketing well, Brian, I think, knows a little bit of the Tesla program. I'll let. So, uh, the Tesla presentation, they were really trying to emphasize that the look is really good and clean. They didn't talk anything about the efficiency. Um, now, some of that is actually a hard problem because uh, if I ask you how many shingles do you have on your roof, you're not going to know. Similarly, um, it, you can't easily say, oh, we're going to give you a solar roof that is uh, a Um, the shingles that they put in, they came up with four different types. One of them is apparently the most expensive type of shingle you could possibly imagine. And so, uh, uh, Jeremy, uh, who is one of the installation companies down here, uh, we were talking about this and said, if he's trying to compete against the most expensive possible uh, roofing system, great. That would completely hide the cost of the solar uh, that you're installing there, essentially. So, uh, but yes, there was almost no details in uh, this uh, presentation at all, other than they look cool. And you need to make sure that when you buy the Solar City roof, that you also buy the Tesla Roadster or the Model X or the Model X. You need the little kid version and you need the Powerball. That was the key takeaway. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Yep. So, yeah, Tesla is definitely doing some interesting things. Interesting things. So we'll we'll see what comes out of that. So, folks, thank you very much. Let's uh, thanks. Uh, let's thank our presenters tonight. Uh, appreciate your time. And as as always, thank you very much. We have the place until eight thirty, so feel free to mingle. So thanks for coming. All right. Thank you.